Hey everyone, welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We're coming to you as always courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. Joining us today on the show is Dr. Doug Kneven. Dr. Doug received his veterinary degree from Ohio State University in 1987, and he is the medical director at Beaver Animal Clinic in Beaver, Pennsylvania, where he shares duties with two other veterinarians. He has earned certifications in veterinary acupuncture, veterinary Chinese herbal medicine, and veterinary chiropractic. He also has advanced training in natural nutrition, massage therapy, and homeopathy. Dr. Doug has been practicing alternative veterinary medicine since 1995. He lectures on the subject at state and national veterinary conferences, including the annual AVMA convention and the North American Veterinary Conference. He has written two books on the subject, Stand By Me, a holistic handbook for animals, their people, and their lives they share together, and his other book, The Holistic Health Guide, Natural Care for the Whole Dog. He also authors the Holistic Pet Care column for the ARE's Venture Inward magazine. And that's available online to members at edgarcasey.org slash members. Doug will be in Virginia Beach on July 18th of this summer for the new Soul Growth Saturday program entitled Caring for Your Pet Naturally, Holistic Health for the Life of Your Animal Companions. Dr. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today on Reflections. Thanks, Brent. It's great to be here. Wonderful. I wanted to first start off talking about, I know you have a program coming up here at the ARE this summer, and I see that your program is all about holistic care for pets. I was wondering, what do you mean exactly by holistic medicine, and how does that approach differ from conventional veterinary care? Well, really, holistic medicine is about the attitude of the veterinarian. It's about his philosophy or her philosophy. So holistic means that you're treating the patient as a whole body, mind, and spirit. And it's really about creating health for the pet. Now, Western medicine, on the other hand, is really focused on disease. Uh, most uh, Western healthcare is not so much healthcare as it is disease care. In holistic medicine, we focus more on the patient. And the idea is, if the patient is healthy, then by definition, the problems have fallen away somehow. So that it's about creating health rather than fighting disease. Now, those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. It is possible to create health while fighting disease. So I really, in my practice, use what I call integrative medicine, where I use the best of both Western and holistic modalities, depending on the individual animal and the individual owner. Excellent. And I was curious, how did you first come about kind of the Casey readings and how are you able to integrate that into your practice as a veterinarian? Wow. Well, my wife actually introduced me to uh, the Edgar Casey readings. It's kind of a funny story. On our first date, um, after we had gone to the, the local aviary, uh, we were still talking and things were going on. And, and uh, I guess it was time for her study group. So on our very first date, she took me to an ARE study group which was, uh, I guess it was a make it or break it kind of moment for her. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And how have, um, what, what did you find the Casey readings have to say regarding the kind of spiritual aspects of animals? Well, it's very interesting. You, you have to delve a little bit into the readings to find some of this information. Casey actually never gave any readings for pets. Uh, but there were people who asked about their pets while they were getting a reading. Specifically, there was a dog that in the readings is known as the little dog Mona. And several people asked if they had had past lives with this dog. And they were told that, yes, they had had a past life with the dog. So that kind of um, validates the idea that animals do have this spiritual nature and that it is something that influences our relationship with them. Absolutely. And as, as a dog owner, I find that the dog really starts to become your partner and your companion. And um, what, what have you found, I guess, the, are the spiritual aspects that kind of explain that? Um, why, why do we have such a deep connection to, to our animals, to our pets? Well, that's another good question. I think there can be several aspects to it or several possibilities. As the case that I just mentioned, the little dog Mona, 
it's possible that we have a real connection to our animals because we've had a past life with them. So maybe we know them, have known them before, and they've known us before. I, I think another possibility is that animals kind of represent nature. And when you think about it, why do people have pets? Think about all the negatives of pets. And you have to take care of them. If you have a dog, you have to take them for a walk. You have to spend money on food. You know, there's a lot of time and energy that's put into our pets. There was even research a couple of years ago that showed that one, one reason that people aren't getting enough sleep is that their pets keep them awake at night. And so we put up with all of this. And the question is, why do we do it? And I think the answer is that as humanity has gotten farther away from nature and nature as an aspect of the eternal or of God, I think that we have this natural um, magnetic force that wants us to bring nature back to us. And I think our pets are a way of doing that. Absolutely. And can you tell us what you consider to be some of the most important factors in the health of your pet? Well, I really think the number one factor is diet. Uh, just like processed food is not ideal for people, I think the same is true for animals. I mean, imagine if you went to your doctor and after the exam, the doctor plopped a bag of people chow on the table and said, this is all you need to eat for the rest of your life. And, you know, this is going to be so easy because... When you go to the store, you can bypass the fruits and vegetables and bypass the meats and just go to the people chow aisle and pick out your favorite flavor. And every meal, you know, you just take a scoop of people chow and put it in your bowl and eat it every day, every week for the rest of your life. Can you imagine that you could get 100% nutrition from a bowl of people chow? It just doesn't make sense. And yet somehow we bought into it with our animals. And so I'm really a big proponent of trying to feed animals more naturally, what they would eat if they were in the wild, what their ancestors evolved eating. And it's a lot different than what we're currently feeding them. And that's going to be a major thing that I'm going to talk about during this program at ARE. Absolutely. And what other factors aside from the diet would you say are really important for a dog's health or for any pet's health? Wow. Uh, so I think that Many times we're over-vaccinating our animals. I'll tell you that I'm running a little study on my own dog. Um, I have a little Maltese. Her name's Katie. And typically, one of the regular vaccinations that dogs get is called the distemper parvo vaccine. It's actually a combination of several different viruses that we vaccinate the dogs against. And many veterinarians do this vaccination every year or maybe every three years. Some of the more progressive veterinarians have gone to every three years. My own dog, the last time I gave her a distemper parvo vaccine was when she was 12 weeks old. And another thing that I did was I gave her half the dose because one of the problems I have with the vaccines is we give the same dose whether we're giving it to a half pound chihuahua puppy or a 200 pound Great Dane. So I gave her half the dose at 12 weeks Every year since then, I've been doing a blood test called a titer, which measures the antibody level against those diseases. And 11 years later, she still has protective immunity against those diseases from that vaccine at half the dose at 12 weeks of age. Now, I'm not saying it works that way for every animal, but there is that potential that the vaccines can last a lot longer than one year or three years or even five years. Absolutely. And I guess I and should I, I, answer. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I think that vaccinating animals more than they need can upset their immune system, which then can lead to a lot more problems down the road. Right. Absolutely. And how, how important is exercise? I noticed as a dog owner over the past couple of years, <clears throat> a lot of dogs have become quite home dogs where they, the owner doesn't seem to focus so much on exercise. And for me, exercise has been a crucial part of my dog's health. And also, there's this kind of mutual feedback where I get a lot of health benefits from it. How important is that to you as a veterinarian? You know, as a veterinarian, as a health care provider, th there really is almost nothing that people can do short of diet more than exercise to improve the health of both themselves and their pets. And when you think about it, as animals evolved, 
they didn't spend the day laying around on a couch with nothing to do. Uh, they were out hunting. They were out, you know, either fighting for territory or defending their territory or uh, running from predators. And that exercise is something that's definitely missing both in our lifestyles and in the lifestyles of our pets. And yet, that's one of the places where I feel like I have the least amount of power <laughs> to try to get people to change their lifestyles and lifestyles of their pets. Right. And are, as you practice holistic um, pet care, is it something that helps you with that feedback of, of making sure that you're living a very holistic lifestyle as well? Yeah, I, I really find for myself that the more conscious I am of my pet's health, the more it makes a conscious myself conscious of my own health. And it's interesting, I have found with some of my clients that if I can make a difference for their pet using some of the techniques I use, such as acupuncture, um, I've heard stories back where the owner is so convinced that this method was helpful that they themselves then went to get acupuncture or chiropractic or something like that, rather than you know, going to conventional medicine or some kind of drug. So I feel really great about the idea that not only am I helping the pets, but I'm helping the people as well. Absolutely. And your program that's coming up here in the summer at the ARE headquarters seems to really focus on empowering pet caregivers. It, it gives you a lot to work with. It lets them know that you, know, you can be a truly holistic um, pet owner. And I was wondering what kind of treatments can people do for their pets to keep them healthy? I know you yourself offer some very um, interesting and I know a lot of people are going to be very drawn to the sort of therapies that you offer. Can you kind of go through what you, um, all the services that you offer? Well, at my office, I offer acupuncture, chiropractic, uh, nutritional counseling, supplements, Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, those are the main things that I use. Uh, I occasionally will use some homeopathy. Uh, and at this program, now obviously I can't train clients how to do acupuncture or chiropractic on their pet, but there are acupressure points and ways to use those. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, and although we can't do chiropractic, we can do certain stretches to make the spine healthier, which is what chiropractic is all about. I'm going to be talking about massage and how people can use massage on their pet. I'm going to be talking about herbs that they can use, homeopathic remedies that they can use. So this is a way not of replacing conventional health care, but of enhancing conventional health care with things that uh, pet owners can do at home for their pets. Excellent. And on a different topic here, I know that Casey, one of the core principles of the Casey teachings is that thoughts are things. And as a pet owner personally, I found that my pet is very sensitive to the thoughts and the energy of the environment. Um, what can you tell us as a, as a healthcare professional um, you found with this? You know, it's very funny. When I was first uh, in veterinary practice, I was a conventional practitioner and I believed everything that I heard in veterinary school. And I would have clients that would come in and they would say, my dog understands every word I say. And I would think to myself, oh, well, you know, the dog's just picking up on subtle cues and maybe they understand the voice inflections, but they don't really understand the words. But the longer I'm in practice and the longer I'm having pets of my own, the more I realize that it really is true that animals pick up a lot more on the energy around them than we give them credit for. And I'll tell you, kind of an aspect of this that I found at my practice is that I have a, a favorite phrase that I use. And this phrase is, oh, it must run in the family. And let me explain when I use that phrase. I'll take the dog in, I'll do my exam, whatever tests I need to do. I'll come back into the exam room and I'll say, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, but Fluffy has such and such disease. And the owner will say, oh, that's so weird. I have that same condition. And then I use the phrase, oh, it must run in the family. So I really think that there's this energetic connection between people and their pets to the extent that sometimes they even share these negative vibrations of diseases or, or and exactly how that happens or why that happens, I'm not sure. But it's 
it's really interesting. I think it's more than a coincidence. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard of stories that where the dog or the, the any pet will mirror the disease that could be going on in the human that they're not quite conscious of just yet. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that really fascinates me about your practice is you practice herbal medicine. Uh, me personally, I'm very big into herbal medicine with my own body, but cool. I haven't so much dove into it with my pet. I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about maybe what herbs you would recommend, um, if you could recommend any single one herb? Well, during the program, I'm going to be talking about a handful of herbs that can be used for a lot of different conditions. A lot of the herbs that we use in human herbal medicine are also appropriate for animals. And there's not a whole lot of research out there on how to dose the herbs, but most veterinarians kind of go by the, the rule of thumb that if you consider that whatever the herbal dose is for people, that's based on a person, the average person supposedly weighing 150 pounds. So if you take your animal's weight over 150, that gives you the percentage of the human dose that you would give for the animal. So that's just a little um, aside for you to, to be able to help uh, use herbs for your pet. Uh, one of the herbs that I find is very versatile and very helpful is milk thistle. And milk thistle is a very safe herb, and it's also a very potent herb. It has a lot of effects on the liver. It can help the liver uh, heal itself. So no matter what kind of damage has been done to the, to the liver, the uh, milk thistle can help. It also helps the liver detoxify. So if the animal has been exposed to a toxin or even a medication that you want to get out of their system as soon as it's done its job, milk thistle is something you can use. One of the ways I have my clients use milk thistle is for people who are concerned about even the heartworm medicine that they're giving their pet. They want to protect them against heartworms, but they don't want to damage the animal uh, because this is a medication that can have effects on the body. But what I have them do is give some milk thistle for three or four days after having given the um, heartworm pill. And that way it helps clear that uh, medication out of their system and help the liver repair any damage that might have been done. Excellent. That's great. And I want to kind of take a step back to a topic we were talking about before. Um, you talked about how important diet is. And I think most dog owners, myself included, will buy the the um, I kind of the, the dog chow type food. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what it, do you offer as an alternative or what do you personally um, use for your pets? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the idea is to feed the animal like they would eat if they were in the wild. And so what I do is I look at the wolf and I say, well, the wolf is not out grazing in a grain field. They're not digging up potatoes. They're really not eating much starch. And yet most pet foods have a lot of starch in them. There's two reasons that there's a lot of starch or carbohydrates in pet foods. One is that it's a cheap ingredient. It's a cheap source of calories. So it helps keep the food cheap. The other is you can't make a nice convenient kibble without some kind of starch to glue it all together. So a lack of starch in the diet is one thing. The other thing you'll notice about wolves is once they catch their prey, they don't whip out a George Foreman grill and cook it before they eat it, right? You know, even right. wolves are smart enough to know that if you overprocess the food, you're going to be destroying all the nutrients. So I'm actually a big fan of raw food for animals. And the misconception that some people have is that I'm talking about raw meat as the diet. And while raw meat would be a big part of the diet, that alone would not be a balanced diet for any dog or cat. A dog in the wild would eat the internal organs, they would eat some of the intestinal contents, which would probably contain shredded vegetables. They would eat the muscle for sure, but they would also eat some bones, so they'd be getting calcium from the bones. All of these different components are part of what is needed to have a balanced diet for a dog. So I'm a big fan of raw food for animals, but a balanced raw diet. There are commercially made raw foods out there where the bones are in the food, but they're all ground up, so you don't have to worry about the dog choking on them. They, uh, they come frozen. It's very convenient. Uh, and to me, that's the ideal way to feed animals. Oops. 
can't control <laughs> the calls in the background. Sorry. No worries. No worries. We can we can edit that out. Don't worry about it. Okay. I guess we'll wait until someone answers that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just keep going. You're fine. Okay. The idea is to feed a dog as a wolf would eat, and processing the food destroys a lot of the nutrients that are needed to really have a healthy diet. And just like it wouldn't be healthy for us to eat only processed food, the same thing's true for animals. And these pre-made, commercially made raw foods for animals, I think, are the ideal diet. Uh, that's what I feed my own dog. That's what I've been feeding her for 12 years now. Excellent. And have you seen a trend that seems to be taking place? Is something that I've noticed of people making their own food at home, to finding the ingredients and putting it all together, I guess, which would cater more towards a raw diet? Certainly, there are a lot of people that make homemade diets. My concern with that is a couple fold, actually. If they're doing it raw and they're using meat that's made for human consumption, unfortunately, a lot of that meat is terribly contaminated with salmonella and campylobacter and other disease causing organisms. Uh, the raw food, the raw meats that are in these commercially made raw foods, because they know they're going to be fed raw. They do things to help minimize the contamination with these bacteria. The meat for human consumption, they assume we're going to cook it, so it's not quite as tightly uh, regulated, actually. The other thing is there actually was a recent study where some veterinary nutritionists went online and into books, and they found oh, over 100 different recipes 60% of them were actually formulated by veterinarians, and they analyzed them for how balanced they were. And I believe it was like less than 1% of those recipes actually came up with a balanced diet for animals. Another concern, so you may be starting with a recipe that's not balanced in the first place. And like I said, a lot of pet caregivers have a misunderstanding of what we should be feeding them in the first place. You know, they don't understand that they need the calcium from bones as well as the, the um, protein from the meat. Um, but then I also find that when I send uh, some of my clients home with a recipe, they'll come back six weeks later and they'll say, well, I couldn't find this ingredient, so I substituted that one and I ran out of that one, so I just forgot about it. And it's really important to get the balance right. If you don't have everything that the recipe calls for, you could be possibly setting your, your animal up for harm. So I'm not a big fan of homemade foods, at least not as the sole diet for animals. At the same time, I'm not necessarily against feeding people food to animals, as long as it's not the major part of their diet, and as long as it is appropriate food for the animal. So for instance, Table scraps are not necessarily good for animals because, for instance, the skin and the fat can really lead to extra calories and can also upset their stomachs. But if you're eating a nice piece of chicken and you cut a little piece off and give it to your animal, if you're eating some broccoli or carrots or anything like that and give a little bit to your dog, there's no problem with that. As long as it's not the major part of the diet, if it starts to take over a high percentage of the diet, then again, you'd be throwing the balance of the underlying diet off. So, you know, maybe up to 10, 15, 20% of the diet could be people food instead of pet food. My only other concern about feeding people food is that animals tend to really like it, which can mean that they can really overeat the food and that can lead to obesity and problems like that. So all of this has to be done um, with the idea that we want to keep the animal its ideal weight. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to have to take a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back with more from Dr. Doug here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Joining us on the show today is Dr. Doug Knieven, and we're talking about all things holistic pet care. 
Doug, I was curious, um, ideal weight with your pet is always a big issue that uh, pet owners are always dealing with. As a pet owner myself, I've noticed quite a few dogs and quite a few pets in general uh, tend to be overweight. Um, can you tell us about your professional opinion about what ideal weight is and how to best go about maintaining that? You know, I think that too many times people show their love for their pet with food. Food does not equal love. <laughs> It's really important for people to understand that. In fact, if you love your pet, you will keep him or her at his ideal weight. There was a study done by Purina several years ago where they took two groups of Labrador retrievers. One group was fed as much food as they wanted to eat. The other group, they looked at however much food the first group ate. They fed them 25% they fed them 25% less food. And they followed them from birth to death. What they found was that the dogs eating 25% less food were skinnier, which actually didn't surprise too many people. But mm -hmm. those dogs, the dogs eating less food, also had a 2.8 year delay in the onset of arthritis and other chronic disease. They also lived on average 1.8 years longer just by feeding less food and keeping them at their ideal weight. Now, when I first learned about this study, I thought, okay, you have this group of Labrador retrievers that are eating as much food as they wanted. They must have been these huge blimpo dogs. No wonder they died early and had all kinds of problems. But they actually graded the dog's um, weight on a one to nine scale, where one is completely ema emaciated and nine is completely obese. The dogs that were getting 25% less food averaged at a 4.5, which is right in the middle of the range where you want them. The dogs that were getting as much food as they wanted averaged at a 6.5 on that nine-point scale. I cannot tell you how many animals come into my office that are over 6.5 on that scale. And the, many times the pet caregiver has no idea that their animal is overweight. Sometimes they think it's funny. Sometimes they think it's cute. But the bottom line is, there's this area behind the ribs and in front of the hips called a waist. <laughs> it's called a waist for a reason, okay? It's supposed to get narrow there. So if you look down on your pet from above, you should see an indentation behind the ribs. Another thing that you can do to see how fit your pet is, is to feel the rib cage uh, on the sides right behind the shoulders. You should be able to feel the ribs. And if you have to press hard to feel the ribs, that means that there's extra fat tissue there and your animal is heavier than it should be. And like I say, just a 6.5 on a nine point scale can mean living two years less. And that's really, really important. Keeping your animal the ideal weight is important. It has to do with how much you feed. It also has to do with exercise. But I have to tell you that it's hard to exercise your way, to, your way out of being overweight. You have to reduce the calories at the same time. Right, absolutely, great advice. And you talked previously a little bit about massage for your pets. And I was wondering, do you need a special pet massage therapist or someone like yourself, or is this something that you can do by yourself? Any pet caregiver can massage their own pet. Uh, with just a little bit of instruction. And I'm going to be talking about that at the conference this summer at ARE. I'm going to show people how they can massage their pets safely. But there's really, you know, when you think about it, you massage perhaps your, your uh, significant other without having any special training. Things that feel good to us tend to feel good to our pets as well. So it really doesn't take a lot of extra training to be able to just rub your pet just the right way. Absolutely. And previously you mentioned a little bit about homeopathy. Can you explain kind of how that works for maybe some of our listeners who aren't familiar with how that works and also how you incorporate that a bit into your practice as well? Good. So homeopathy was developed in the late 1700s by a German physician uh, named Samuel Hahnemann. He realized that the medicine of his day was not doing very much good for people. And he started to work with very low dilutions of medicinal substances. So homeopathy itself, the word means like cures like. 
And the idea is that a substance that can cause a condition in a healthy individual can also be used to cure that kind of condition in, an, in a person that has that same problem. And I'll give you an example. If you think of Ipecac, we use Ipecac to induce vomiting. On the homeopathic side, we use a very weak dilution of Ipecac to relieve an animal or a person that's having the symptom of vomiting. So when we give it at a very low level, basically it stimulates the body to be able to fight that problem. It's, it's a way of helping the body to cure the disease on its own rather than using some kind of medication that's gonna try to fix it from the outside. It works on the energetic level of the body. According to homeopathy, all disease starts on the energy level of the body and then eventually it gets manifested physically. And a lot of us have experienced this with our pets. I know as a veterinarian, I see this kind of thing all the time where a person will bring their pet in and say, he's terribly, there's something wrong with my, my dog. And I'll do a physical exam and say, no, everything's fine. No, 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 there's something wrong. And usually they have some you know, very mild symptom, but they know that there's a problem. So we'll do blood work, we'll take x-rays, and I can't diagnose a disease in the pet. It's because the pet doesn't have a disease. The pet has what we call dis-ease. That's where the problem is on the energy level of the animal, but it's not manifesting yet physically. The neat thing about homeopathy is we can catch the problem when it's at the energy level and correct it before it becomes a disease. And that's what we try to do with homeopathy. One of the ways that I use homeopathy in my practice is that vaccinations can have a negative effect on the energy system of the body. There's a homeopathic remedy that can be used to counteract that negative effect that vaccinations can have on the body. Excellent. And I, I think some of our listeners, who, especially the ones who are ARE members, will recognize you as being the author of the Holistic Pet Care column for the ARE's Venture Inward magazine. And I was curious, what has been the most rewarding thing for you about writing this article for the issues, and, and what kind of feedback have you gotten from it? Oh, I, I've really enjoyed doing my column in Venture Inward. For me, as I put my thoughts into words, it helps me to be able to understand it better, as well as being able to explain different concepts to the pet caregivers. And I do get uh, emails periodically with people uh, from people who are having problems with their pets, asking for advice, but also emails from people who have had different situations with their pet that they've been able to heal naturally, and they give me the information that they've been using that has helped their pet. So it's it's increasing the information that I'm getting as well. Absolutely. And I understand you've also written two books on this holistic pet care subject. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, Stand By Me, a holistic handbook for animals? Well, Stand By Me is, is my ARE press book, and it's really based on bridging the two major factors in my life, kind of the Edgar Cayce readings and holistic medicine and the love of pets and animals. So each chapter has wisdom from the Edgar Cayce readings, as well as my own experience kind of thrown in. Uh, we talk about uh, basically how to care for your pet from the beginning to the end. So for instance, there's a chapter about how to select a pet for you. There's a chapter about communicating with your pet on a non-physical level, kind of, you know, pet communication. There's a chapter on nutrition. And then we get to the last chapter, which is kind of about death and dying and how to let go and what happens after animals die. So it's meant to be kind of this, this uh, guide throughout the life stages of your pet and throughout the life stages of your relationship with your pet. Wonderful. And you raised a, a point that I'd love to touch on a little bit more. Um, being somebody who's very familiar with the KC readings and the principles that came out of them, other than what you've applied to your holistic pet care practice, what else have you personally taken away from the KC readings that's kind of been incorporated a lot into your being over the years? Well, 
a healthy lifestyle is a major thing. Uh, you mentioned earlier the idea that thoughts are things. I think that's a major um, thing that I try to remember in my life as I go, go through life. Uh, and I would have to say that meditation has been a big thing for me as far as how the Edgar Casey readings have influenced my daily life. Uh, my wife and I medit meditate together uh, on every morning. Uh, usually I have my dog on my lap while I'm meditating, so it's kind of a, a group activity for our whole household. And I really feel like that gets my day off to a great start and helps me remember what's important. It helps me tune into the subtler aspects of life. Excellent. And we've talked quite a bit about your presentation that's going to be taking place at the ARE here this summer. And it'll be in Virginia Beach at the ARE headquarters. The actual date is July 18th, 2015. And we'll make sure we give all of our listeners um, the links that they need to sign up for that. It's actually a part of our Soul Growth Saturday program. And yours, you've entitled your program, Caring for Your Pet Naturally, Holistic Health for the Life of Your Animal Companions. And I was wondering, what do you ultimately hope the attendees will take away from your presentation? Well, I'm going to be giving people a lot of information that they can apply to the health of their own pet. Um, sometimes my presentations can almost be overwhelming in the amount of information that I put out there. And the idea to me is that different people are going to resonate with something different. Some people are going to resonate perhaps to homeopathy. Others might resonate to uh, herbal medicine or massage or acupressure. And so I hope that everyone takes four or five or six different things home and actually starts using them on their pets. To me, the major message is that medicine isn't something you go to the veterinarian for for your pet. Medicine is a part of your daily life with your pet. And you can incorporate some of these techniques to help keep your pet healthy and even help them when they're having some issues. Excellent. Well, Dr. Doug, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's been an honor to have you on, and it has been incredibly insightful, especially for me personally being a pet owner. So I want to thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom, and we look forward to seeing you here in Virginia Beach in July. Thank you, Brett. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Don't miss your chance to spend a day with Dr. Doug Knieven as he'll be in Virginia Beach on July 18, 2015 for the new Soul Growth Saturday program. His presentation is entitled Caring for Your Pet Naturally, Holistic Health for the Life of Your Animal Companions. In Dr. Doug's presentation, he will discuss how diet, exercise, holistic therapies, and alternative medicine can help your pets enjoy optimal health and energy and, of course, live a long, healthy life. To register for this Soul Growth Saturday event and other events offered here at the ARE in Virginia Beach, you can visit our website at edgarcasey.org conferences. If you'd like more information on locating a holistic pet care provider near you, you can visit the website at ahvma.org. On behalf of everyone here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment and, of course, moretalk.tv, I'm your host, Brenton Bickerstaff, reminding you that despite what may be shown to you by some, things are always getting better. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on your planet. Thank you so much for tuning in to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Hope everyone has a wonderful week, and I'll see you next time. Much love. And now it has come time for the thought for the day here on Reflections. And joining me as always for the thought for the day is Dr. Bill Austin. Bill, thank you so much for joining us for the thought for the day today. Hi, Brent. Great to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on. And if you may go ahead and read the thought for the day for our listeners today. I'd be happy to. This thought comes from reading 5753-2. But to know that you spoke unkindly and suffered for it, and in the present may correct it by being righteous, that is worthwhile. You know, when I first read this, one of the words that I don't resonate with is righteous. And so, I, you know, I, 
I had to take a look at that within myself. What what what's the Casey readings referring to when they say righteous? And I think it has to do with a correction. Can I get it right? Not I'm righteous, I'm you know, better than someone else or I'm lording over someone else, but can I get it right? You know, and how many times have I in the past, you know, said something or been unkind to another human being? Kind of for the glorification of me or to say, hey, I am right with this and, and you are wrong or whatever the situation. And, and it hurt that individual. I can keep that in mind. I can try to apologize and try to make it right. But in the next situation, I can try to make it right. If I keep that in mind, then that will be, indeed, as this thought is saying, that will be worthwhile for everyone, for the other individual, and for me as well, for my own personal, I'm going to say soul growth, and for soul growth it is feeling good within myself, feeling like I'm more in a line with those creative forces, with God and those attributes that come with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you raised a good point right there at the end. Um, <clears throat> Casey's very careful about the way he words this, and I, I like that you you raise the point that you don't resonate quite with the idea of righteous. And I think sometimes he does this on purpose. Obviously, he's coming from his own perspective, and his own source that's coming through him um, is coming from its own unique perspective, kind of its own truth. But I, I think he words it in certain ways to really get us to think, and he, and he also hides kind of little gems of wisdom in here. For this one, the first sentence says, but to know that you spoke unkindly and suffered for it, there's a little gem in here that basically says that it, it's the principle that when we speak unkindly of others, it's it's not so much the important aspect is, yeah, of, of course the other person is going to suffer for us speaking unkindly about them, but what's really happening is how intimately interconnected we are in this this feedback that we all create with each other is at the end of it we're the ones who's suffering the most mm -hmm. and when it comes to Casey talked a lot about forgiveness and I think that's an essential tool that we all have to work with and that when you are speaking unkindly of people and I myself like everyone is guilty of of losing you know losing my deal in the moment and speaking unkindly of people or, or not keeping you know check on that and allowing my ego mm -hmm. to kind of assert itself um, I'm I'm the one who really suffers with that and um, I, I think it's it's something to always be remembered that the more negativity that you push out into the world it's really hurting yourself and I think uh, um, this is one of the most essential things, one of the most essential lessons that we have to learn as individuals and as, as a collective society or collective human culture um, is that all of the unkindness that we're sending out to everybody is really detrimental to our own health. It's detrimental to our own soul growth and development. And yeah. the, in the next sentence, Casey says, in the present, and I think that is one of the most essential things that we're waking up to right now is realizing that in the present moment, regardless of how weighed down we are by maybe all the negativity that we've done in the past, all of the choices that we may deem as being wrong or missteps, is that if you keep that, that bigger picture, you realize that, okay, it's happened, it's in the past, what do I have to work with right now? And what I have to work right. with is always the present moment. And Casey says that in the present moment, we may correct it. And I'm, I'm, I would go ahead and stop that sentence right there and say that in the present, we may correct it. And by, by being righteous, you're right. I don't necessarily uh, resonate greatly with that as well because only, I think it's only because we've kind of been programmed in a way to realize that righteous is kind of this um, – has a, got a bit of a dogmatic uh, attachment to it. But it, it's – I think I want to focus on just, just correcting – I guess wronging, wronging your right – or making 
the mistakes, the missteps that you've done in the past right in the present moment. And I think it's, it's incredible to always remember that we can start right now working with forgiveness, working with, with not doing the same things that we were doing, speaking unkindly. Um, mm-hmm. And a, as we do that, I, th- I think I, I have the strong feeling that as we do that, we actually help to heal the past and the future. And we help to set up um, more of a, a healing path for ourselves as we go into the future. And I think in the present moment, we can do all of that. That's the beauty of this this now, this present moment that we have, is we can start right now, and I, I think we can right all the wrongs that, that we've done. Well said, Brent. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today on Reflections. For the thought for the day, it is always a pleasure listening to your thoughts. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Have a salubrious day, Brent. Thank you. You too.